if you've been with me before, you know that I'm going to play a, a video for about stuff, some of the things that I do first. Then we're going to go into Jeremy's uh, presentation. And then at the end, I have a surprise for all of you that we're going to do. So here goes uh, a, a video. Um, and enjoy this. This is, a, this is a little bit of humor. This is to wake you up and start you laughing. Hi, I'm Tom Olson, and I'm going to give you some reasons why you should always pay sales or use tax on the purchase of an aircraft or a vessel. Let's get started. Number one reason, you're a politician and you'd get recalled if you were discovered to not be paying your fair share. Two, you're a private citizen and you believe politicians can do a better job spending the money than you can. Three, the tax is nothing but petty cash to you, and you don't want to do the extra paperwork required to legally avoid the tax. Four, your corporation is doing well, and you don't want to be attacked by politicians for being a corporate jet owner. Five, you're timid and can't face a tax auditor. That's my job. Let me do it. Six, your wife or girlfriend will nag you for taking a risk. I have a couple of questions for you. Where was she when you took the risk that created the company that created the wealth so you could buy the vessel or the aircraft? If she was complaining about risk then, you've already proved to her that risk is worth it. Seven, you got such a good deal on your aircraft or vessel, you feel like you should share something with the government. I never feel that way. Why do you? Eight, although the Supreme Court of the United States of America has affirmed your right to legally avoid tax, you still think it's illegal. Nine, the last time you got audited, you met a great-looking woman that worked for the tax agency, and you want to see her again. Sure, all these are kind of in jest, but if you don't like any of them, you don't want to use any of these reasons, and you want to legally avoid the tax on an aircraft or a vessel purchase, Call me first before you buy it. So I hope that was a great way to start your morning. That's a little cup of coffee for me. I'd like to now present my good friend, Mr. Jeremy Cox, who he'll tell you a little about who he is from uh, Jet Brokers in the center, center part of the country. I think he's near St. Louis. And let's get started with today's webinar about what can happen if you lose your aircraft logbooks. Jeremy, take it away. Thank you very much, Tom. Uh, I think I gave the same preamble on the last uh, webinar, but uh, just to give some background, I, I grew up on a pig, poultry, and dairy farm in England, learned to fly at age nine, moved to the USA in 1991. I've been around uh, aircraft for 43 years. I'm a, a National Aircraft Appraisers Association Senior Certified Aircraft Appraiser. Uh, this takes 10 years of experience and at a minimum, 10 years of experience and two years of training to become certified. I'm also a uh, NAAA Qualified Buyers Agent 2. I hold valid AMP mechanic ratings with inspection authorization. I also hold my FCC license with radar endorsement. I have more than 1,200 hours on a commercial multi-instrument ticket, but no medical. Uh, I have been, I have flown the Cessna Conquest, the Citation 650. I have done two North Atlantic deliveries in light aircraft, and I have air towed targets um, on contract with the British Navy. Uh, my maintenance experience is very broad, from light aircraft through Lockheed, Boeing, and Airbus large cabin aircraft. And I have bought and sold 67 different makes and models of jets and turboprops plus one helicopter. And that's not 67 transactions, that's probably 400 transactions, but 67 various types of makes and models. So, uh, I advanced the slide, but... Uh, uh, I'm not going to mention any names, but that uh, first picture uh, in the slide is uh, of a joint customer of Tom's and mine. Uh, we bought last year in November uh, a Hawker 850. <laughs> They're catching the sunset. Anyway, um, the issue uh, we're talking about is lost logbooks. The title is lost logbooks uh, and the impact on aircraft value. Uh, this information is pertinent to aircraft owners, chief financial operators, aviation department managers, aviation accountants, aviation lenders, and leasing companies. So let's talk about values. 
Um, the issue uh, of provenance, you may have heard this uh, around the sale rooms of Sotheby's and Christie's, they talk about provenance. Um, the definition, as you can see from the slide, hopefully you can see the slide, Merriam-Webster says it's uh, um, the origin or source. Uh, the second definition is the history of ownership of a valued object or work of art or literature. Another term relevant uh, to this webinar is pedigree. Uh, this is particularly popular amongst horse breeders, and I often hear it used when talking about an aircraft. Again, Merriam-Webster defines it as follows, the history of the family members in a person's or animal's past, especially when it is good or impressive. The origin and history of something, especially when it is good or impressive. So the history of an aircraft is documented in its logbook. Um, I think everyone would agree that an airplane, an aircraft is a, a valued object. And um, so I think we can actually say that aircraft have pedigree. Uh, its history has to be good or impre impressive or both. Um, and there's Da Vinci's uh, Mona Lisa. We have uh, uh, pedigree shown at the top and not so quite good pedigree below with the donkey. Kind of gives you uh, an example of uh, the issues at hand. But uh, anyway, um, what is the definition of a pedigree aircraft? The aircraft can't have any damage history. The aircraft must be maintained by following the recommended factory maintenance program. The aircraft is maintained by an OEM service center or a well known and reputable MRO that is a certified repair station. All mandatory and most, if not all, recommended service bulletins complied with. The interior is fireblocked. No items installed under a field approval. No insurance claims made against the aircraft. You, if any, uh, FAA Form 337 is issued for the aircraft. All FAA 8130 airworthiness packages, all work order packages, invoices, manuals, and logbooks, all complete, concise, and stored, ready to be included with the aircraft and sale to a new owner. Total time and landings reflect the standard 400 to 500 per annum. So that kind of gives you insight into how I would define a pedigree aircraft. So as you can see, ratings equal dollars of values. Um, and lots of people have different ratings for different things. There's standard ratings in the blue book. The NAAA have their own ratings. Also, the folks at the VREF have their own ratings as well. And as you can see, it equates to values, which is quite important. Um, so you get to the point where somebody wants to audit the aircraft. And an auditor comes in, all your logbooks are available. Um, but what happens when the uh, auditor or the buyer or the appraiser or whom, whomever is auditing your books finds damage history? When they find damage history, they're going to dig much deeper than they normally would. Here's examples of damage. Um, obviously, from the examples you see, you go from, from fairly minor hangar rash. Uh, which can or cannot be determined as being damage history. Uh, there's a story about that wing that I'll tell you about at a moment. Um, you have that hangar collapse at Washington Dallas Airport that damaged all those airplanes. Um, you've got gear up, runs, uh, runway uh, diversions, exits from the runway. And one of the, the very difficult ones is uh, the fire um, or overheats, uh, whether it's from bleed air wiring, whatever. It's very difficult to assess the impact of the damage when it's uh, stressed by the heat injury. Is the temper or heat treat of the damaged affected materials is definitely called into question. And there's a number of tests that MROs and the manufacturer can perform on the, on the structure to determine whether uh, it's affected or not. But it's, it's, it's a, a big deal. Um, hangar rash normally isn't considered to, to be uh, 
advantage, but in this case, this was a, a hawker and they ran the winglet into the hangar doors. And it actually did enough, uh, hawked the aircraft enough, the wing enough, it actually uh, dented the fuselage. Even though the wing is bolted to the fuselage, kind of separate from the fuselage, the fuselage sits on top of the wing. It, it actually moved the wing enough to, to dent the fuselage. So, it was more significant than you, you imagine. So sometimes a, a, uh, a hangar rack event is, is actually. Um, next slide. Uh, the NAAA rates damage, and um, we've got categories of damage. Uh, minor and moderate have a small effect on value. And can, can you see these slides very well, or should I read them, Tom? I can see them fine. They're really clear. You've done a great job creating them. And there's no point in me being one of those boring presenters that reads his slides. <laughs> but as you can see, non-deductible damage, superficial damage, minor damage, moderate damage. Um, as I said, minor and moderate damage uh, will have a small effect on and or desirability. And desirability obviously has an effect on it. And we'll come to that. So we move on. Um, major damage history and extensive major damage history. Uh, hopefully you can see those, but uh, uh, often, as is the case when we're involved in uh, brokering a sale, major or extensive major damage are normally deal points, or at the very least, the largest value of the issues. Like I said. So, what is damage history? Here's the definition uh, that the FAA uh, actually quotes in the FARs. It's in uh, FAR or CFR 14, FAR 1, 1.1 1 .1 general definitions. They actually talk about the, uh, damage or major repair. Major repair, there's a definition. And then Appendix A to Part 43, they talk about major alterations, major repairs, and there's a whole slew to that appendix, which is better just to navigate over to the FA website, pull up those as well. Talks about river things. I can the video. Some structural things. I've lost my Can you hear me, Tom? Can you hear me, Tom? I hear you fine, but the volume is going up and down. So if there's something you can do on your end to increase the volume, I've punched mine up 100 to 100 percent, and it still feels like at times that your volume is going up and down. All right, let's try that. Let's turn my That's volume. The, on yeah, on. speak from the diaphragm, as an acting coach once told me. Just told me. Okay. All right. So. Um, aviation insurance adjusters uh, define damage differently than, than most other people. They, they, uh, they rate them as in motion or not in motion planes or uh, rotors in motion, rotors not in motion. And obviously not in motion is always preferred by them. So um, there's two price guides that I subscribe to, uh, the VREF and the Aircraft Blue Book. The BREF kind of tackles damage history um, uh, head on and they actually publish a damage history chart, which you can see depicted in the slide. And um, basically, the, uh, I'll read you what is on that chart. So it's hard to see. But the VREF chart can be used as a general guide for aircraft and damage history, but does not apply to any one particular airplane or kind of each incident is unique. There are many variables when dealing with damage history, but it is usually a negative. How long ago did it happen? Question mark. How extensive was it? Question mark. What kind of airplane was involved? Question mark. Who repaired it? Question mark. Where the parts, where the parts factory new? Question mark. These are some of the more important questions. And they give two examples. Two examples of like damage include tail damage and prop strike, in which the engine and prop. Were replaced. Some hangar, some hangar rash 
or other non-flight related damage may be so minor as to fall below the scope of their charge. An example of heavy, heavy damage would be landing accident shears a wing off. There is much that falls in between these two levels. And they say when using this chart, first determine the degree of damage, like moderate heavy, and find out who repaired it and what kind of parts. If it was repaired by the factory, was the factory new, you on the chart, parts, the damage is much less significant. Also determine how long ago the damage was repaired. If the chart at the bottom is speeding upward, the appropriate time lapse when you hit a line most nearly corresponding to the gear line proceeded at a 90 degree angle to the left. This can give you a rough estimate of damage. The blue book really, they, they kind of fall more in line with, uh, with this webinar. Um, they say an aircraft that has sustained damage in its lifetime has diminished value. It's difficult to assess the extent of the diminished value because so many variables must be considered. The most important of which is the type of damage. Obviously, a grazed wing tip is not serious in a gear up landing. Also, to be considered in the number of years the airplane has been successfully flying since the damage was repaired, the reputation of the repair shop, and whether repairs were, were, were factored. They don't have a chart. They don't quote percentages other than when they talk about loss log So that's how the, the price guides deal with damage history. Um, as you can see, the bottom line of damage history is it damage never goes away. Uh, it value effect will lessen over time. Uh, obviously, the more flight hours, more cycles an aircraft accumulates after it's been repaired, uh, and the, the repairs are tested and Damage effect on value is less. It will never go away. Um, what do you actually uh, quote as a loss to damage? Um, this is this is kind of my definition. Uh, at Jet brokers, uh, we we found that when we have an aircraft that we're representing for sale and there's damage history, about twenty percent of the potential buyers just walk away they say we're not interested. Um, it's interesting also to note that uh, people outside the USA are more inclined to be willing to accept damage uh, as opposed to US buyers. Uh, I guess damage is much more prevalent in Europe. Uh, some people say 10%. Uh, there's 30% shown on the uh, VREF chart. Uh, we know 20% of potential buyers uh, will walk away with damage. So I, I've highlighted 20% as, as the factor uh, that equates to the loss in value. And there is, there is a whole point to talking about damage, uh, the loss loss of loss. Because basically, Here's your auditor. He's come to look at your logbooks, but the logbooks are missing. There's an empty shelf. So what do you do? And that's why I've talked about damage history. The only assumption he can make, she can make, the auditor can make, is there's damage history. Because you don't know whether there is. You don't know if there isn't. Because the books are present. So but ultimately, you have to assume that there is. So. Um, that's why I, I talked about damage history right up front. So you understand the biggest issue is missing logbooks. So I, I, when I did the research for this, uh, this seminar, uh, webinar, I, I wanted to talk about paper. And I, I thought the Egyptians invented paper, but apparently uh, it was invented around 100 uh, years before well, BCE or in China, about 105 AD, uh, they say that the Han Dynasty Emperor O.T., government official in China, named Zhao Ayun, was the first to start a paper-making industry. So paper is a thin material produced by pressing together moist fibers of cellulose pulp derived from wood, rags, or grasses of sheep. So, 
talking about logbooks, most logbooks are made out of paper. That's why we had a discussion on paper. And also to understand the dynamics of paper. Because uh, paper is very fragile, especially if it's subjected to fire, water, rodents, and mold. Um, top left, I'm not sure where that is. Actually, it kind of looks like Kansas City, and I'm not sure. But uh, I remember when I, I first came on board at Jet Brokers, we had a Falcon 20 for sale. It was one of Jet Fleet's airplanes uh, years ago. We were the first to uh, have a management program in the 60s and 70s. And they had a line I'm losing the volume again. I can't well, hear you. Okay. They had a, they had a, a line shack in Pittsburgh, which um, burnt down and had all the logbooks for all the different airplanes they managed. And uh, so we actually had an airplane that had some charred pages that have been photocopied and, uh, and, and had reconstructed logbooks to the best that they could. But uh, for all intents and purposes, 70% of the logbooks were missing. Um, at the airport where I'm sitting speaking to you is the spirit of St. Louis Airport, um, Kilo Sierra, Uniform Sierra. And, and in 1993, we had the levee break. And we had 19 feet of water on the airport. And you can see the control tower, there's a Sable Liner. Sable Liner, we're actually based here. And that's a Sable Liner underwater. Uh, but most of the airplanes got to fly out. But, uh, you know, it's an example of flood damage. Uh, airports are not free from flooding. Um, and as you can see, some other effects. But uh, um, uh, paper is fragile. And uh, if the logbooks, uh, are not digitized, then you're going to lose them in, in a damage event like that. That's why I strongly urge people, uh, even if you don't subscribe to a, um, uh, a formal commercial uh, document scanning service, um, go out and buy a digital camera. Or I think 99% of us will have a smartphone, and uh, there's no reason why you can't use the smartphone to scan your pictures. Um, I actually have an app on my phone called Jot Not Pro, and it will uh, scan and turn those those pictures into uh, PDFs, which I can upload to a cloud or, or email to myself. Uh, but uh, whenever I go and uh, bring an aircraft to market, or I go do an appraisal, an on-site appraisal, I will actually uh, take a picture of every logbook page. And often for, for the bigger airplanes, the airline type airplanes that I appraise, uh, I might end up with uh, 2,000 logbook pages, and it's easier and quicker for me to put those on my 60-inch uh, flat-screen TV hanging on the wall down in my basement and look at the logbooks than actually physically sitting at the desk at the hangar going through the logbooks. But anyway, I strongly urge you to digitize your records. Um, another example, it's interesting. I think Flight Docs may have been the first ones to do this. Uh, but um, the uh, maintenance tracking services, uh, AMP, AMP, Flight Docs, they, they actually usually now scan your logbooks, and there's a digital copy available to you through your, your portal to check your maintenance. Um, years ago, before CAMP bought Cessnacom, Cessna, we had a, a, a Citation 560 uh, that had some missing logbooks, and we made arrangements through Cessna, they, I think back then, it was some time ago, uh, they actually were putting the log, the Cessnacom maintenance transaction reports, which you see depicted on the slide, they were uh, putting them on microfilm. And you could contact them and ask them to reprint your log books. And I think they quoted, I can't remember whether it was 3000 or $6,000 to reprint all the maintenance transaction reports, put them in binders and send them to us for that airplane that uh, is missing logbooks. But uh, just be aware that um, uh, there are um, uh, facilities available if you are a subscriber to the, the tracking programs. All right, moving on. Um, this, is, this is my strongest recommendation to anyone that owns an aircraft. Please go out and buy a fireproof, waterproof safe, and keep your logbooks and notes and your other paperwork as well. Remember, we talked about pedigree or uh, provenance. 
um, and it, it goes beyond just uh, log entries, uh, airframe, engine, propeller, APU, whatever, logbook entries, maintenance entries. It goes beyond that. Uh, if you uh, have work orders and you have receipts and invoices, um, they're not part of your legal record, but they will add provenance. They will add pedigree when you come to sell that aircraft and pass it on to the next person if you keep all those together with your, your records. So I consider them to be part of the record. But you have to store them safely and properly. All right. Um, so that's a, that's a Falcon 50 we sold <coughs> several years ago. And it gives you an idea of the extent of records that will go with an aircraft. Um, I actually was in uh, uh, Sofia, Bulgaria two years ago and, and bought a uh, BAE 146-200 for a client of mine. And I counted 62 boxes, the same size you see there, the file uh, boxes, paper boxes. There were 62 of those. We filled the, uh, the main cargo hold uh, as well as the, uh, the, the midship cargo hold with their me. Jer Jeremy, can I interrupt you for a second? Yes. yes. Y yesterday, I was in a hangar of my client who yeah. is delivering an aircraft today that they're selling. I saw four pallets stacked five feet high. They're six by six pallets of documents and file boxes like you're talking. So it, you know, he also told me a story that when he went to buy that airplane, he bought it from an I think it was an airliner someplace in the Middle East, and all of their documents were stored in garbage cans, rubber garbage yeah. cans. So that when you went to pick up an airplane, you got garbage cans that were all labeled for the time period. Obviously, the older documents are on the bottom, and the newer. But there's all different ways of storing this, and I'm just giving you this information as an anecdote to. Depending upon how much that airplane's been used, <laughs> you're going to buy a lot of paper. You're going to buy a lot of paper. And that's that. No, that's exactly right. And and obviously, it's uh, a requirement in the FARs to transfer all available documentation for the aircraft uh, at the time of the sale. So uh, uh, you have to be very mindful of that. Um, in fact, in the airline realm, I, I often find that you're talking uh, as as many as a hundred boxes or more, and they're all scanned. And they have a cloud service that you can actually run a uh, search and find the box number uh, or the section number where the boxes are being stored to actually find the information you're looking for. So, yeah, there's many ways of dealing with, with this paperwork. And there's that age old joke about uh, uh, Bo a Boeing engineer said that uh, uh, when asked how he knows when the aircraft is ready to fly, and, and I think the analogy goes, when the aircraft um, is matched in weight by paperwork, then the aircraft's ready to actually fly. So anyway, um, next slide. Um, I, I've actually personally experienced this, and this is very unfortunate. Um, this is not an actual my picture. I grabbed this off the internet to show a badly handled uh, cardboard box. But I remember we had a King Air that uh, – went to pre-buy and they didn't put the log books on the airplane, so they shipped them. And uh, the box that showed up for the pre-buy was a, had a hole in it. And we'd lost some books. <laughs> it's like, dear God, come on. So if you have to ship your books, make sure it's in a proper container that uh, won't come apart, won't be thrown about and damaged by the shipping people. I'll give you an example. A lot of people, these... These Rubbermaid type containers are very popular with people. And, and as you said, I've never seen the trash can used, but that's an interesting idea. I think I might suggest that to people. Um, <laughs> all right. So we've, we've discussed the issue of uh, damage and the assumption that has to be made uh, when logbooks are missing. Uh, you have to assume there's damage and you have to affect the value of the aircraft or at least make a calculation unless somebody can come up with the logbooks. But that's because of uh, error 
or uh, or an example of um, damage, what whatever the reason is that the paperwork somehow has gone missing or has been damaged. But often, <laughs> they, and uh, that's a frightening picture, but the, the fact is um, somebody might hold your logbooks hostage. And uh, the, the issue there, in fact, I had a, a Citation 10 that we sold, and the pilot, there's, there's a breakout box. Uh, and it, I remember specifically, we're talking nine years ago, I think, when, when this happened, I actually had to put it on the work order at the service center and actually buy a new breakout box. And it was uh, $69,000. The breakout box comes with the airplane at new delivery and the pilot was upset with his employer and he kept the breakout box and it cost the employer $69,000 to replace it. Well, the same thing happens sometimes with logbooks too. Um, and uh, I've been asked, uh, is, is it legal for somebody to hold logbooks hostage? Well, I went online and uh, I've done business with Cooling and Herbers uh, in Kansas City they're a great law firm and there's a lady there that uh, actually has posted on their website a uh, ruling and it's a longer much longer document than what I've quoted here but the bottom line of this is not you can see that there's the link to download that PDF about the bottom line is it's not against the law to hold blog books hostage. Um, the only time it's it's actionable with the FAA, there's nothing in the FAA uh, regulations other than uh, having to transfer ownership of the books at the time of sale. Um, there's nothing the FAA can do unless uh, it is during a sale and you petition the FAA and the party holding the books actually have an FAA certificate of some kind, whether it's a repair station, their repairman, their uh, pilot or a mechanic, AMP, whatever, then the FAA, if you petition them hard enough, may turn around and, and enact some kind of certificate action against the people holding the books to actually release them to you. But otherwise, uh, Elizabeth Bassa Brown from Cooling and Herbert says that uh, there's two options for you. File a lawsuit and sue the party in possession. And uh, if you're successful, then the court may order the party holding the books to turn them over to you. Um, or you uh, you file a claim for diminution of value, which is exactly what I was talking about. You have to make the assumption, since you don't have logbooks available, that there's damage history, and therefore the value is uh, diminished. Okay. Um, I've only got uh, three more slides to tell. This, this moves very, very quickly, so I hope you've got some questions. You're doing great. You're doing great. Thank you. Hopefully you can still hear me. Um, I, I quote the National Aircraft Appraisers Association because I am a uh, certified by them and proud to be a member. And uh, they they say that uh, uh, by doing an on-site appraisal and examination, inventory of the aircraft, uh, it's going to con contribute 85 to 90% of data for the written report. And then 10 to 15% is uh, from outside research online and making people that have comparable airplanes. Um, anyone that uh, does an audit on an airplane uh, uh, without sight, without eyes on the airplane and the records is very foolish because it's not accurate. And bottom line of what I'm trying to say there about on-site uh, audits, inspections, um, if you paid for a certified appraisal, uh, to satisfy an official requirement, uh, it has to be conducted uh, with an on-site inspection. On -site. Otherwise, is this a reliable report? All right, so that is it. The next slide gives you my contact information. Um, I, I'm, I'm open to any questions if you have, have any. Um, let's see. Fire resistant, not fireproof. That is one of the, the suggestions that has been made by somebody. Uh, fire resistant, not fire proof. I guess, yeah. I guess there are safes that are 
in college locker room. They want to be as good as they can get. Any questions? All right, I'd like to ask you a question. <clears throat> Absolutely. I'm, I, I'm listening to what you're doing, and uh, we've had little pieces. You and I personally have had little pieces of this conversation in the past. And as a result of a conversation you and I had months ago, I started a new service for my company so that I have something to provide for everyone outside of the state of California. At this particular point, it, all of my past experience of everything that I've done of having a perfect record versus audits of the state of California of, of always winning. I've had 1,400 clients and they've never paid any tax. So what I'm going to do is play a little short video and I'm going to thank Jeremy for inspiring me to do something that I should have thought of by myself. So stand by. Here it comes. And then very much please, if, if you if you have any, hang on. Don't go anywhere, Jeremy, because you're going to be required to answer a question when we get done. The purpose of this video is to announce a brand new service that my company, Aero and Marine Tax Professionals, is offering to all unregistered business aircraft in the United States. The name of the program is Verify. Aero and Marine historically has been known as someone who does tax exemption processes relative to the attack by the state of California on their sales and use tax transactions. I'm announcing today, and you're getting to hear it for the first time, that we now have a process that's going to assist all unregistered, U.S. registered aircraft that are being used for business. Okay, The new program is called Verify. The foundation of that program is extremely similar to what we already do versus the sales tax transactions in California, which we've done a little over 1,400 cases and we've never failed one. But we've re I just realized in some discussions with aviation attorneys where I discovered that these IRS audits are being failed 50% of the time that I can help you guys too, okay? And Verify is the name of that program. We're going to give you a list of documents that you're going to send to us on a monthly basis, and every month we're going to review those to determine that your logs match up with your fuel receipts, to determine that the, the entries that you have on the flight logs make sense. Remember that the IRS wants your money. Remember that you're part of the 1% if you own an aircraft and you're under attack. Regardless of who's in the administration, you're still under attack by the IRS. Never forget that. If you think I'm kidding, think about how easy it was to get a 501c3 if Tea Party was in the name of your 501c3. They, they don't follow whether the president or the Congress is a conservative or a liberal. The IRS is after you exactly after you. So I've, we've created this program that is just like our program that produces 100% success. It's a different focus. Because the IRS requires you in business aviation to maintain that on an annual basis, more than 50% of your flight hours are for a business purpose, okay? We can control that. We can look at what you're doing. We can give you a heads up if you're starting your percentages are get too low. So it's a valuable, valuable service and I strongly recommend that you give us some consideration. And we're doing exactly what we've been doing for all people that I will we'll call California targets, okay? It's exactly the same process. The only difference is, is the threshold and where we want to wind up. So let us help you. Let me tell you how this program is going to work. You're going to engage us. Then you're going to take copies of your flight logs, copies of your fuel receipts, copies of your maintenance documents, and copies of, we'll start with the smallest program, of just your business support. And you're going to email them to me. I'm going to take your documentation, assign it to one of my tax consultants, and she's going to take the step of inputting your aircraft logs into an Excel spreadsheet, 
just so that we can check and make sure that your math is okay. And we find in logs about 75, 80% of the time there's some form of mathematical error or the airport designator on the log doesn't match up with the fuel receipt. We're going to take all the weaknesses out of that. We generally can do that between one and two hours a month. So it's not very, very expensive. If there's anything else that you want us to collect for you, because our end goal is at the end of the year, the taxable year, we're going to create a system for your CPA or your finance department. We're going to send them all these documents collected by month, quality controlled, and they can use that to file your federal tax returns. I do not want to take any work away from your CPA. I want to make his life simple and I want to be your conscience. I want to be the person that's helping you to create this discipline to collect this stuff because if you think the IRS is going to reduce its pressure on you, you're wrong. So Jeremy, yes sir. How do you how, how do you like that presentation? I like it. What did I miss? <laughs> oh, I don't know. By by collecting all of that stuff, you're going to add provenance. You're going to add pedigree to the airplanes, as well as uh, make sure that nothing's missing from your side of the the tax avoidance business. It, it's a good thing. It's a really good thing. So well done. Thank you. I endorse your, your uh, new service. <laughs> so, Jeremy, apparently my producer is telling me they sent you some questions. It oh, came from the oh yes, indeed, yes. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, what is going to be a way to determine the loss of value of one year of lost log books versus two years? Well, it's pretty simple. You, you have a gap that cannot be accounted for. You have no idea. If it cannot be reconstructed, then you've got to assume there's damage history. So whether it's one year, two years, or 20 years, the effect is the same. You've got to assume there's damage history. So hopefully that answers your question. It's not, I guess, just to finish up with my response, it's not variable based on the number of years missing. It's either there or it's not there. It's either damaged or it's not damaged. It's either diminished value or it has full value. There you go. Um, once, uh, let's see, uh, once the video is over, I'm an attendee. I don't know what that means. Okay. Uh, uh, many, so it says, hi, Jeremy. Many times when I review logbooks, they may be complete, but they were poorly written, confusing, and had incomplete entries. How do you handle the valuation in that case? That's a good question. It's a very good question. I mean, number one, we are in an English-speaking uh, country. Uh, aviation has been deemed to be uh, the, an industry that uh, reads and writes and speaks English. Um, but often when I go abroad and look at uh, foreign airplanes, the logbooks are in, uh, in, in foreign language. I do have on my bookshelf a fantastic dictionary that... Uh, is all aeronautical terms in five different languages. I think uh, McGraw Hill published that. It's very helpful to me, but um, even though I'm not fluent in Spanish uh, I, and French, neither one, uh, I've, I've been doing this for so long, uh, more than 20 years, reading Falcon log books that sometimes are in French and uh, uh, a lot of airplanes from south of the border that may be in Spanish. So you, you kind of pick it up and understand, but that doesn't address the, the question. Absolutely good point. They need to be legible. And if the, the logbooks are illegible, then if nobody can interpret them for you or to tell you what they say, then yet again, you have to make the same assumption that there's, there's damage. Um, years ago, I bought an airplane from Paris. It was a Falcon 20 that had never been uh, in the United States, and all the logbooks were actually in Portuguese. We actually had to, because it was based in Portugal, uh, we actually had to get a, uh, since we imported the aircraft here into St. Louis, we had actually had to get the, um, the MIDO, the, well, no, not the, the GATO, General Aviation District Office uh, out of Kansas City, 
they had to, we couldn't use a DAR because the airplane had never had a U.S. certificate of airworthiness. So an FAA inspector had to come over and look at the airplane to issue a certificate of airworthiness. But part of that requirement was to have all the logbooks translated into English. And we had to engage a uh, college, a local college, to use a, a Portuguese language student to actually uh, translate the logbooks and then write certificating, uh, uh, certification um, statements on each translated page that was acceptable to the FAA. Um, so yeah, it, it, it's a big deal. If they're, they're, they're complete, but they're illegible, same instance applies. You've got to uh, consider that there's damage hidden, uh, damage history being hidden. Um, one of the things that really annoys me with, with logbooks and repair stations, especially, even though uh, I, the expectation is the best maintenance will be performed by uh, a repair station for you, um, sometimes they coll collude with an owner that has an aircraft that has had damage and they will try and bury that information uh, in the log entry because there's only a requirement to keep or maintain records, work order records at a repair station for two years. And after that, you can pitch them. The reality is uh, the, the, the best quality repair stations, which there are many, we're talking about the majority here, we're talking about 99% of repair stations, will retain those records and keep them ad infinitum for, for decades. But if they're working on the minimum, then two years uh, after those records expire, they can burn them. They're gone. And it's perfectly legal for a repair station to make an entry that quotes a work order without any description of the work performed. And it's also perfectly acceptable for them not to issue a, an FAA Form 337 uh, because they're not required to do so. Uh, when it's the work performed by a repair station. So sometimes you will see damage buried, hidden uh, by that very method. But the truth is you can sh usually discern uh, when you see gaps in logbooks, uh, gaps in history, uh, long periods of time when the aircraft is down and there's no particular reason other than there's a uh, work order number quoted, you can make an assumption. Yet again, you, unless that information can be provided to you, then you've got to assume it's damage. Um, let's see, uh, blockchain, how will that affect the provenance of documents, logs? How will this change standard operating practice? Hmm, I'm, you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm not quite sure what the, the definition of blockchain is. Is that uh, basically where everything is digitized and we're using everything with, with the cloud. Um, if that's the, the intent of the, the word usage blockchain, then I would say we have no issue, no value issue whatsoever. The FAA accepts digital uh, or virtual records and there's no reason why I as an appraiser and the industry wouldn't accept digital records or, or virtual records, as long as the records are released. So I don't see that being an issue. Uh, another question, how do you handle a situation when you know one or more logbook entries exist, however it or they are misleading, wrong, or possibly a cover-up or something? Yeah. <laughs> well, you, you, you get on the telephone and, uh, and you try and talk to the people involved. And, and if they are being furtive about it, and they are trying to hide something, then then you have to make the ruling and make the statement in the report that uh, um, something's been hit, being hidden, and you've got to assume it's damage. That's how I would deal with that with a cover up. Those are all the questions that I've got on my screen. Anyone else? Otherwise, oh no, no, you don't get to sign off yet. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. All right. I want to bring up a couple of things about my new Verify service. Yep. We store all those documents electronically, <clears throat> so they're in the clouds, and we send them to your CPA electronically, organized by the month and the year, but we keep those records for you. That's part of the service. Um, secondarily, <clears throat> excuse me, we're, we are offering anybody who's interested in that service, anybody that's on this webinar and wants to engage us, that you can buy in blocks of four hours 
by paying for three and prepaying those within 48 hours of you seeing this webinar. So I encourage you to do that. When I originally started this process to creating the Verify program with Jeremy, I was thinking it from only the income tax thing. And I'm realizing that maintaining those documents for you is has value to you when it comes time to sell the airplane. And that is what Jeremy's been talking to you about. So our service, while it, the old video that you saw was directed at business aviation, if you're concerned about maintaining the value of your aircraft when it comes time to sell it, this service also works for you. And if you're not using it in business, then you don't need to send me the business documentation. It's pretty simple. So. We're very interested in working with you. I'm going to give Jeremy all the credit for giving me the idea to do something that I should have done 10 years ago. And um, if there's anything that we can do for any of you, you, you obviously have, you're connected with Shay in my office who produces, does a great job of producing these webinars. Um, if there's anything that we can do from you, even if you, even if you uh, uh, do no matter what you do or whether you think we already offer that service, um, just ask. And I'm sure that Jeremy operates the same way. We are here for you. Jeremy is here for you. Uh, recommend other people contact us. Uh, I'd yeah. love to have your recommendations also. You, uh, you heard it here first. Uh, Tom, Tom's giving me credit for the idea of the service. Uh, don't give me credit. Just send me 10% of your profit. That's all. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> He's acting like he didn't hear that. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, only only because Shay was talking to me, and you can talk to her about that. But no, um, I, um, I do want to uh, follow on from what you just said, though. Um, for for uh, twelve five and above turbo turbine jet aircraft, there's a lot of services out there available to them already, uh, and they may be subscribing to them with uh, maintenance tracking services as I've shown in a previous slide. But the reality is uh, there's a whole wide world of aircraft that have no service available to them whatsoever. And that's why this service would be very, very uh, attractive and important to them. Uh, and even if your, your logbooks amount to one logbook for the airframe, one for the engine, one for the propeller, you should digitize it and if you're in the state of california you're avoiding sales tax you should have tom digitize it and track it okay and this brings up a question that just came to me it says do you handle clients clients in only california the answer to that is with the verify program it doesn't matter where you're at on planet earth it has value for you to store have us store those records for you digitally for anybody that has the concern about uh, losing or the documents once they're in our Verify program, we'll store them in the cloud. We'll have uh, copies on our servers. And I, I will do everything humanly possible to make all that stuff available to you. Um, the only thing I can say is that you have my honor on that, OK? Um, I, I, because it's a brand new program and I, I don't have any, I don't have a lot of experience in storing digital records. Um, you know, I, I, we'll do whatever we can to make sure <clears throat> that we, that those are available to you because we'll have it stored in multiple different places. I believe that they will never be lost. I, that is my intention. I don't know why you're limiting yourself to planet earth with SpaceX and Virgin Galactic. You want to make it intergalactic, my friend. Well, Elon's a friend of mine, and I'll have to talk to him about that. But uh, he's trying to figure out how to get me the records for his uh, car that's now floating around in space. And he yeah. forgot about that before it took off. So Yeah, space uh, junk. So uh, I do have another question that popped up. How secure is the cloud so that it doesn't get hacked by Russians or anyone else? Beats the heck out of me. I'm not a cloud guy. So, uh, But if somebody wants to hack... The, the cloud that's storing your your uh, maintenance records and inspection records, then so be it. I mean, I can't imagine how that is. But uh, that's a question for Tom with his service, yeah. if it's financial records. 
I don't know. I can tell you this. I was with a guy in Miami a couple of days ago who's in the business of cybersecurity, and he says every human being on the planet has been hacked. Has been hacked. You've been hacked. You just have to recognize that it's if you're putting it out in the clouds or if it's ever been transmitted over a computer that someone, and don't blame everything on the Russians. There's plenty of bad people on this planet to go around. You just have to recognize that you've been hacked. You recognize that the NSA is listening in on all of your phone calls and all of your emails, and I guarantee we make statements in phone calls and emails every day that we hope that the government hears, even though we're aware of it. Just be, you know, be smart about what you say, be smart about what you transmit, and uh, I'm, uh, the only thing I can tell you is you've already been hacked, and you know, it's going to continue in the future. Those are evil, evil people, generally, and you know, you just got to you know, be so successful that whatever they do with your information, it just doesn't matter. That's the solution to everything, is be so successful in everything that you do that it doesn't matter, that they can't collapse you, whatever your empire is. And, you know, I could get up on my soapbox and talk for another hour about how I feel about that, but Jeremy's heard it all before because he's had a few drinks with me. So I, I want to thank all of you for attending this webinar. Please contact us about the Verify service. The phone lines are open. And I'll even give you Shay's extension, which is 121. The main number is 916-691-9192, and hit 121, and Shay will talk to you about the Verify program, because she knows everything. She just fell off her chair because I said that about her. All right. So thank you again for attending this webinar. <clears throat> I will try to do a better job of not having so many frogs in my throat next time. Thanks again to Jeremy for being supportive of everything that we do, and likewise, I give you my support. Um, and if you have anybody has any more questions, please text them in right away. I'll give you about 30 seconds, and we're going to shut this thing down. www.jetbrokers.com if you want to contact me. And thank you very much. Appreciate it. Or you can call me, and I'll give you a cell number, and you can bug him 24 hours a day. Yep, that's fine by me. <laughs> All right. So thank you, everyone, for attending. I appreciate any feedback from you about the value of this to you personally. And we're ending the event. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, Jeremy. Take care.